Okay, uh, so what I'd do, like to do now is introduce our guest speaker for tonight. Uh, Associate Professor Roseanne Quinnell is from the School of Life and Environmental Sciences at the University of Sydney, which is where our speaker uh, from last month, Dita, um, also works as a researcher. So we're very pleased to have Roseanne with us tonight. And the title of her talk is Art, Culture and Botanical Science. And that encompasses two projects she's going to talk about, uh, how to visualise botanical patterns under a microscope, and also um, uh, an app that she's developed called Campus Flora, which um, has Aboriginal names for plants on the University of Sydney campus. Now, I know Roseanne is experienced at Zoom meetings because she's been teaching students from her bedroom, I understand, by Zoom. Uh, so I'll now um, hand over to Roseanne. Thanks very much, Roseanne. And I'll just get Ralph to unmute Roseanne, that's fine, and mute me. Okay, thanks very much, Roseanne. Thanks everyone. I'll just get to my share screen um, and I have to optimise for video clips my desktop. Well, I have to say it out loud because although I am experienced with Zoom, it's a matter of making sure that you speak out loud and that you ask people to give you a bit of feedback. So Ralph, is that my presentation up on screen? Yeah, that's fine, Roseanne, go for it. Perfect, thank you so much. So I'm um, having taught for all through semester one with um, uh, using Zoom, I'm now literally flying blind. I can't see anything except my presentation. So this is where it gets um, a matter of trust. I hope I can keep you in, your, in, your, in the Zoom room while I give this talk, because I won't have any idea if anyone leaves. So this talk is uh, to cover a little bit of art, a little bit of culture. Roseanne, all very much. Yep. Um, can you just move that um, toolbar? Ah. It's in the ah, middle. Okay. At the moment. That, yeah. That's I'll have to put it up there. Yep. All right. So yeah. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Ralph. Uh, so it's going to be uh, on a couple of projects, but first and foremost. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the Dawal speaking traditional owners of the Sutherland Shire. I'm actually in the Sutherland Shire at the moment um, and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I'm in the Shire and I am of the Shire. Um, uh, to get to what this image is, this is a transverse section of a hakia leaf. So this is a hand cut section that I've done as part of the teaching in semester one. And I think I have to use these. So part of my background, this is uh, probably familiar territory to you. If we were meeting face to face, we'd be meeting around about uh, the red dot. Um, I was born a little to the right of that red dot. I grew up up here. I went to school here. I went to school here. I went to school here and I went to TAFE here. So like I say, I'm uh, very much informed by a, a, a childhood and adolescence in the Sutherland Shire and part of that was very much the vegetation of this region uh, that I still absolutely love. I got to this particular, I got this particular invitation, I think mainly because of this piece of work that I wrote in April and it was um, a blog post for the Sydney Environment Institute, another link up here with the University of Sydney. And the frame for this one was really in part to uh, the response to the global COVID crisis. In recent years, I've really been, I guess, linking, the, linking my whole self and the relationship humans have with plants. So I'm very interested in that, in that relationship we have that in a Western sense, we don't acknowledge particularly well except for example, when people die. So flowers feature very much at all of our ceremonies. Um, otherwise, we're relatively plant blind and there's a whole body of research in education about plant blindness. So I was, uh, people read this piece, I was it, it touched, it, it, it made a connection between people um, and hence I was given this 
particular invitation to speak at this meeting. So this piece was influenced by COVID, but there are two associated pieces of writing I've done. One of them and from that were kind of based on this one, The Joy of Plants was published in the Flora Foundation in January. Um, and there was another piece that was in a journal of human arenas looking at Humboldt romantic science and ecocide, a walk in the woods. So this one was the first one essentially, started in the first instance. Um, and ecocide is our kind of um, environmental angst about the, the natural world, our relationship with it, and that we seem to be going to hell in a handbasket. So it's a bit of a crisis. Um, as I was writing both of these pieces, Australia was uh, on fire. So the bushfires were of major concern. And then this uh, latest piece was, uh, had the other layer of the COVID uh, uh, pandemic coming through. So it's kind of a departure from, I guess what you'd consider to be a traditional plant scientist perspective. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, how COVID has impacted me. Um, it's, it's changed, it's actually changed uh, my practices a lot in education. I'm just gonna move this maybe down here now. Um, and for all humans, the world seems to have changed. For me, when I've been connected with plants the most in semester one this year, this is my bedroom bench. Uh, this is a view outside my window. Plants, I'm surrounded by them. I'd cut hand sections, put them onto the microscope. This camera I could feed into my computer and teach from home. So these are some display plants um, that I'd section online for my students uh, to be able to teach plant anatomy. So for from April to July, this was my world constrained and confined in my house. Um, however, getting a lot of pleasure from being able to still interact with the botanical world at what I love is the microscopic level. So pretty much my relationship with plants with the botanical world started uh, professionally in about 1990 uh, up until about 2005, very much my engagement was framed within academia. And academia has three parts. It's the teaching part, the research part and the outreach part. So most of uh, this is the most pre prestigious, research is the most prestigious. I tend to do a lot of teaching. So these two have been the ones that have been at the forefront. Um, and outreach, maybe not so much. And then there's always focused on the botanical literacy of students. So the more you learn about plants, um, the more you can appreciate the world around you. From about 2005, um, uh, there's been a change in how I approach my uh, relationship with botany and that really informs my professional outlook and the work I do as a as an academic. Um, I still do a lot of teaching, still do a lot of research, but outreach seems to be coming more into focus for me, um, still with botanical literacy, but now I've kind of got a bit of a bug up my bum to make sure everybody um, appreciates plants, that we're addressing plant uh, blindness, and I don't particularly like the deficit model, I prefer to look at the, the non-deficit model of botanical literacy rather than saying someone's plant blind. It's just like they need to become literate um, with respect to plants. So for probably the last 15 years, I've been doing a lot of this kind of outreach uh, to make people more aware of the botanical world and to hopefully love it as much as I do. We can learn a lot from historical views about uh, learning and teaching botanical science. And I think this was last year, I gave a talk at the library at UCID, looking at these beautiful illustrations. So before, uh, we used to have microscopes, of course, so these, these diagrams have been constructed by somebody looking down at what we would now consider to be a simple microscope and doing these wonderful illustrations. Um, and then hand coloured. So in the school of, uh, we were in the School of Biological Sciences, 
we had a collection of these beautiful um, wall charts uh, by a fellow called Kanai. So I, I, I find this fascinating. Um, this, this notion of draw, because everyone's got a camera, you know, I've got a camera on my phone, I'm taking photos of plants and all sorts of things all the time. In the olden days, oh, um, people, scientists in particular, drawings. So, and there was a much bigger focus on qualitative research than on quantitative research. Um, everything seems to have to be about numbers now, but being able to sit and look carefully to be able to look at and visualize patterns in botany and to put them and declare them onto paper for sharing, um, I think is, uh, we, we seem to have lost something in moving to cameras. And so these wall charts, very famous, uh, the first run of this particular series of wall charts um, is in Kew Gardens, uh, sent all around the world to teach botany and very much in the German tradition. So can I was a, um, a German uh, botanist and very much, he, loves, he loved his algae. Um, and there's a link to the talk if you're interested, that was a recorded talk. So this is circa 1800s, um, this beautiful collection of scientific illustrations. And they were teaching tools to support students learning botany. And of course, botany was a lot more popular in the older days. Um, it was a standard for anyone doing pharmacy or medicine. Uh, anybody, there weren't really, were there scientists back in those days? Think in biology, they were probably called naturalists rather than biologists or zoologists. Certainly there were a lot of people who called themselves botanists. There were a lot of people who called themselves naturalists. Um, and there's a whole lot of these collections that have been digitized now and in a shared space. So the ones that we had at the University of Sydney, um, I shifted them over into the library and they've been digitized and they can have a look at those as a digital collection. And they all kind of converge on this thing of communicating the patterns in botany in words and in pictures. Um, and of course, how you do a drawing in botany is, uh, is there are conventions around that. Scale is crucial, spatial scale, temporal, temporal style, scale in terms of developmental stages. Um, and then there were links between form and function. So it, in Kanai's time, it was very much the focus on form and then they developed another kind of extension of that connecting form with function. Uh, and so here's the form kind of uh, image. So this is one of these beautiful photographs. Um, they're all in German. So anybody who can uh, understand German, you'll have a field day reading all these labels. So this is image one. This is the the, the German description of what this is. So this, this is a key concept in botany um, in terms of uh, pollination biology, what pollinator would be able to pollinate this um, and what is the function of why the anthers up here and why the anthers are down here, why the style is here in this one and why the style is up here. So this is heterostyly dimorphism in this one particular species of plant captured in these um, delightful drawings and the longitudinal section through the gynecium and then the kind of 3D image of that. So I have in mind at some stage um, to mount a citizen science project to be able to, people who can speak German and English to do uh, translations of these German descriptions into English because these are still legitimate teaching tools when we teach botany or when we were teaching botany in face-to-face -face classes. I would make sure that some of these beautiful historic um, uh, uh, wall charts, teaching wall charts were in the lab class so that students could see the value of drawing well. So to, and I'll get to this in a minute, uh, there, there are some people who think you'll never know a plant well unless you draw it. So you're looking, the way you have to look at a plant, looking very carefully, to, is different if you're going to draw it. So you're, you're actually 
making sure that say this is one half the top of the style is about half the way down the floral tube and be very and that scientific information being captured in a drawing so that careful attention to detail uh, so if I live long enough I'll mount this citizen science project and put a call out for people to help do these translations so we can get even more value out of these wall charts um, into the future there is a connection with another botanist who was a fantastic science communicator. He was uh, 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 A.A. Lawson, Abercrombie and Anstruza Lawson. He was in uh, 17, 1870 to, he passed away uh, less than 100 years ago. He was the foundation professor of botany at the University of Sydney. And he studied in Glasgow. There's this kind of big tradition of Scottish uh, uh, academics coming over and working at the University of Sydney. I think it kind of harks back to Maclay in terms of the Maclay Museum. So there's a lot of uh, Scottish influence at the University of Sydney in science. And this is, uh, he studied under Bauer and this is where that form and function kind of linkage was happening. Uh, when Lawson started in 1913 there were 130 students in botany next year almost double you know six years after that there were 3,000 students in botany so he must have had this amazing gift to infuse uh, uh, enthusiasm for botany uh, through his lectures um, and he also saw the importance of drawing well. So this is an excerpt from um, an article about him. And he believed that unless you could draw the living organisms and the changes that took place during life and the reproductive stages, you did not understand the subject. So he was a big advocate for a collection of qualitative data through drawing. Uh, and with a student, we wrote a paper about some of the work he did and his role um, in terms of botanical literacy. And we had a whole building um, dedicated to teaching botany at the University of Sydney at some stage. Like many other places across the world, botany um, is not taught in the same way. I think the last botany degree uh, in the UK stopped in probably 10, 15 years ago. So botany has certainly fallen out of favour. And I, I think I'm personally offended by that, <laughs> that, that a whole kingdom that's so important to our existence cannot be taught. Um, and, and Lawson, he was such a great communicator. He didn't just communicate botany to and with his students. He used to give public lectures. And he had a collection of these things called lantern slides that he'd use, and this is the projector. So this advent in technology meant that he was able to shift his teaching away from not just using those beautiful wall charts. And I sometimes wonder, was he the one who ordered those wall charts, um, the Kanai collection of wall charts? Uh, and then he had his own collection of hand-coloured um, lantern slides and he used to give public lectures um, very much communicating botany to all of Sydney basically and he'd charge for it and uh, charge quite a lot actually. He also lobbied the, um, the government to protect indigenous plant species and he was very much lobbying for wildflowers in the Native Plants Protection Act in 1927. So he must have had some kind of um, a visceral connection to the native plants of this, of this region. He used to also take lots of field trips with students. He had a belief that you learn better in the field than you do in a laboratory. So that kind of being present and having, uh, being surrounded by plants was of benefit in learning about the botanical world. So Lawson was able to share his knowledge more broadly because of the advent of a technology um, a device, the lantern slide. Uh, 
And we can pretty well do the same now with apps. So since 2013, university has offered the Campus Flora app. Let me just keep moving this around a bit. And this is an app. This is the map. This is really the load page. And if you click one of these pins, it'll give you some information about the plant. This screenshot is a little bit old. It still has the old jacaranda being um, indicated, which has uh, the arbor plant number of one. So all the plants on, on many of the plants on campus, the trees are curated in a database um, by arbor plan or arbor safe as it's called now. So we created this app um, and the jacaranda mimosifolia is a plant of significance. In the app, there's 85 families of plants, there's um, close to 200 species, and there's over 2,000 individual plants into, in the app at the moment. Uh, and there's a navigation system where you can look for species, search for species. You can look for all members of the one family as a botanist, that's kind of a useful way to be able to navigate. And there's also a, a, a collections of plants that can be formed into, um, into trails. Let's shift you up a bit and go to the next slide. This is one trail. So really I view this whole Campus Flora app as a storytelling device. This is the Pachigurung Trail. I've just had to recraft it um, in recent times. And so this is the new Chow Chuck Wing Museum that's, I think it's gonna open in November so that you can jump on to the, so I've recrafted it so visitors to the museum can jump onto the trail, walk around. In this particular Pachigurung Trail, the aim of the trail is to learn the Sydney language. So if you follow this through, you'll be able to meet up with the trees um, and in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture, plants are our brothers and sisters. And I really resonate with that idea that they're members of our family. They're not seen as any different to us. They're, they're not lower down in any kind of uh, biological hierarchy. They're brothers and sisters. And in this trail, you can meet these plants and you can learn their names. So this is what you'd see every pin, you'll get this little uh, uh, label come up and then if you follow the arrow, you'll get more information about that um, plant. But for the Pachigurung Trail, this is what it's about. So it's named after an Aboriginal woman who was uh, of the Gadigal Nation. She shared her culture with the Sydney colonists in the 1700s and she was one of the first documented teachers of Aboriginal language. Uh, she was extremely generous in offering her language. Mainly she offered it to Dawes, um, who was here to, as an astronomer, to watch some kind of comet. And I don't think the comet ever arrived. So Dawes Point was named after um, Dawes uh, and where he set up a small ob observatory. And him and Pacha used to hang out. She'd teach him the, the Sydney language. And because he had a background in um, languages, in Greek, in Latin, when he was able to document linguistically the words so that when people found his notebooks again, that and one of those people who used his notebooks is Jackie Troy. Um, Jackie Troy is a scholar of Aboriginal languages at the University of Sydney. So I've worked with her and used her work to um, reconnect or to re it's not really reconnect reconnect isn't the right word but to um ensure that the sydney language name is is as privileged as the scientific name and the western common name so here's bunya it's leptospermum um, one of my favourites is Guman. So Casuarina Glauca is Guman. Uh, there's Duman, which is uh, Port Jackson Fig. So you can learn these names. The issue for the University of Sydney campus is that we have other plants where we could offer the name, but we don't have the plant. So I'm very working very closely with ground staff 
so that we can expand this list as much as we possibly can by putting in the trees where we have the Sydney language name, but we don't have the plant yet. Um, and then we've got here the grass trees, the Gagaja or Gaddies. So that's, uh, I understand that's how the Gadigal um, got their name because of these particular um, plants and the university is now planting a lot more of these gaddies around campus again as a as an acknowledgement for the traditional owners and planting them respectfully um, to acknowledge that wonderful relationship that indigenous people have with with their country and i think most of us will recognize that in ourselves each pin when it comes up you'll see it's illawarra flame tree um, here it gives some information. The one that's here in the main quad, it's a commemorative tree. It's been planted, um, planted at the same time as the replacement jacaranda tree, recognising that the original jacaranda had been, got some kind of rot, had to be taken out. Another jacaranda was planted, this is the main quad here, was planted and at that same time, a, a, a uh, bracky kind of chitin was added in, and these are the uh, these are the indigenous names in a couple of languages down here. Like Kurrajong is the Darug language in Darug language, um, so we can start to I don't know. I find this I just think why haven't we been doing this for a lot longer? The app itself is in redevelopment at the moment. You can still find the web app here, but I'm still redeveloping the two mobile apps that will link in with the, uh, with the, it's called a web app. So this is the web app version. And then there's two mobile apps that interface with that. And we're just doing updates on that at the moment. So it will be available. I also hope to work with a group of engineering students to get a readily deployable system. So people in schools can potentially map their trees in their own school campus um, and collect the stories, like I say, as a storytelling device. If we segue to some of the other projects that I've been doing, um, I have had an exhibition with one of my students uh, an art exhibition using some of these micrographs. So we had an exhibition we called it Harvest. Um, it was a charity exhibition to raise money for one of our partner farmers in Cambodia who had passed away to raise money for his family. Um, how am I going for time, Ralph? Um, you're fine, keep talking. Okay, fine. Um, I might just go into that gallery in a minute, but the other one, when I was doing for Sora, I had some students just come and talk to me. One of them was a student who arrived at my doorstep and said, can I work on campus floor? I want to be part of that project. Um, he had a Chinese background and I said, yeah, you know, can you help me with the pinions for the plants that come from, <laughs> that evolved in China? And he went, yeah, sure. So he worked with his family to offer the pinions in um, for the, you know, for plants that had like uh, ginkgo, for example, is first evolved in um, China. So he found some of the, the some of those names, which I thought was great. Another student came to me. He was doing composition at the con. Um, and he took some of the botanical elements and turned them into sound. So this is where you have to kind of hold on to your seat. Um, I never knew this was possible. If this is an image on the left is an image I took of the, the former jacaranda in the main quad, beautiful branching pattern. In fact, that branching pattern is unique. It has a signature branching pattern. Uh, this music student took images took this image and he took images from the campus flora app and he made sound out of them um, and i'm going to segue here so let's all cross our fingers to just see if this works And be 
because I love it so much, I'm going to do it again. So what this is, it's almost like a tapestry. So it's got dots and dashes. And as the cursor moves up this pattern, it generates sound. And in this instance, it sounds like tom toms. skip that one because it's not very good. That one was what does the word description sound like? So you can run an algorithm over the words of a plant description and it will give you that sound. I also think that's just bloody amazing. So, if, so this particular, oh. so all these images that you're seeing in the background, they're all, image, all images from the botany course, many of which I've um, generated myself. And because he is some kind of genius, I think, as a music composer, he was able to see the, the potential of the, of the visuals and of word descriptions to create a sound file and soundscapes out of that. I don't know about you, but I find that remarkable. And if you want to look up more about Kieran Frame, he has a whole lot of other absolutely brilliant um, uh, projects. He had Tree Hugger at one of the exhibitions uh, at Vivid, um, which is a another brilliant uh, innovation. Yeah. Hmm. Can't find that, hey? Eh? So I do know I have that on here. These are the graphics that we did for the art exhibition for Mr. Vantar to generate some money for him. This one's a transverse section through a pediole that was actually of the jacaranda in the main quad. Stained with toyodine blue. This is a transverse section through a leaf of gargaja or the grass tree. This is banksia. And this is casuarina from Gumam. And we auctioned these off um, and we did pretty well actually to raise money for Mr. Vanta, and we were able to take that money back to Cambodge on our last trip. All I can think there is like, remember when we used to have to go overseas to travel? It's like, mm, it's unfortunate we can't do that. Uh, there's other stuff that I do. One of them is um, a virtual microscopy. So if this one works. So these are high resolution scans of actual microscope slides. And this is what our second year students in botany do. Let me get a good one. Okay, here's eucalyptus. So this acts like using a microscope that you can zoom in onto the image. Let's just try and get some other ones. And I'll get one that I did a hand cut section for. So that's that one. So Colgus is one of the ones. I've just got to keep looking over my shoulder. I think there's the dog at the door. So it means that when we had to do the online pivot for teaching, students could still interrogate slides much like they would in a classroom. Let's just adjust that. Or adjust their microscope. So this is just Colgus, the cambium. Um, and then 
I'll add some more annotations to this. So it's like, it's like having a microscope, but it's not exactly the same as how you would use a microscope. So I still always advocate for students learning how to use the microscope themselves. So that's some of the other stuff I do. Um, another other bit of the stuff I do for those people who, um, I guess if you're an animal lover, this is some 3D imaging. So the micro, virtual microscopy is 2D imaging. This is 3D imaging. And I think I've got this one up as well. It's this one. And this is a CT scan of an echidna. And in the Sydney language, it's uh, Barujin, Barujin. And so you can see, actually it makes me feel a bit sick. That's how much of a, of a plant person I am. Um, makes me feel a bit sick to have a look at this, but it just means it's, a, it's the sister project in, in a lot of respects to the Campus Flora project so that we can share our beautiful uh, fauna with people in other countries because this is all in a shared space. So that's pedestal 3D. And I think that's pretty well all I've got to say. So this is the one of my favourite sections at the moment. Um, the stomata, the sclerids holding up that beautiful palisade layer. So yeah, that's me. Thanks very much, Roseanne. If you'd like to, yep, um, turn the share screen off. So if anyone would like to ask any questions, that was such a fascinating diversity of plants and it was great to hear so many messages that we as a community group also recognise, I think, how it's easier to um, learn in the field. And we do miss our, our sort of field trips at the moment, uh, getting out and about. And we've also had our own project where we've tried to use technology to uh, share our local plants with, um, with the community as well. So lots of things uh, resonated there. Um, if anyone would like to ask a question, you can either type a question using the chat button in the bottom of the screen, or if you want to unmute yourself and wave your hand around and ask a question, um, that can work as well. So I'll just try, we've got, over 30 people. And Roseanne, you'll be pleased to know the number of participants actually increased while you were speaking. So you didn't lose anyone, the numbers went up. Um, you can unmute yourself as well, Roseanne, so you can answer. Yeah, that. yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, I can see, I can see that. Yeah, I know, so um, I'll just go with just, uh, there is a question, it, it's, oh, there's a so comment. How um, fast is it's, Campus Flora app available for anyone to have a look at? Yep, it's freely available. It was actually for the mobile apps, it was one of the first, it was the first uh, education app in the University of Sydney App Store in 2013. So that's one of my great claims to fame. Um, and very much I work with students as partners in all of the work I do. I find um, Students, um, I think I think I work better with students than with other academics, although I know you had Dita here and he's in the same school as me and we, you know, I'd work with Dita in a heartbeat and we've been working on some projects recently, um, particularly with sustainability. Uh, so yes, yeah, students really respond well to that, uh, to making an app. So they call it their app. So they say, it's my app, and I go, no, it's my app. And then one of the other will go, no, 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 it's my app. Um, so, yeah, it's readily available. I hope to relaunch the mobile app soon. We're just updating them. So you can appreciate that the apps are seven years old. So they do need to be refreshed every now and again. Um, yeah, fantastic. So somebody's already downloaded it. If you've downloaded the app, there is an issue with it because it needs to be reconnected with the web app. Um, and so it may not be uh, working effectively, but I'm, I'm in my spare time, I'm doing the best I can with that. I do have another question that's come up is um, the, the transverse section is sustained with toluidine blue. And it's a it's a um, it's a stain that discriminates between lignin and cellulose, so it will stain 
cellulose purple um, and lignin blue so that you can pick up if you're not colorblind of course um, you can pick up differences in in the molecular composition of cell walls and also the thickness gives you an indication of what kind of cell type you've got there um, I think uh, yeah, if someone's got, got maybe it'll be recorded so yeah that would be yeah, um, there question yeah. I was just going to say the um, the images that you the pictures you auctioned for the fundraiser <clears throat> that if they were made into cards I think they'd be very popular but particularly the Xanthoria one is yeah. that a possibility do you think be a nice yeah, fundraiser. We, did that. we did that too so we we at the at the exhibition of the physical uh, uh, Actually, I'm looking at one right now. I bought one for my niece and it's actually, it's literally above, and I'm in her bedroom at the moment. It's literally above this computer. Um, we had, uh, we got them printed really beautifully. Um, and then we also had cards printed. We, Dan, my student, he printed two, way too, more cards than we could sell, but they were really popular. And we still got any? With, <laughs> yes, we do. We absolutely, we do. And we ended up at Newtown Market, um, selling them at Newtown Market just before Christmas. I think it was, must have been last year, selling them off, trying to flog them so that we could send, take some more money with us back to, um, to Mrs. Vanta, who was the widow of the, one of our partner farmers who'd passed away. She was, yeah, pretty, she was pretty happy to get, you know, the funds so it's one of those things that was good for us. You know, we like to doing the exhibition. I actually love sectioning plants. Um, I love, always surprised when I get a good section and when they look so beautiful. And I think that again, that's, it's, it's another kind of device to get people to be interested in plants because they do look like stained glass windows. And when you start layering narrative on top of that, that you can call it by its first name, so, in, you know, like Golgudja, the Golgudja section. So we selected plants for that exhibition where we, we could offer the Sydney language name as well as having a beautiful image. So we could have that kind of blended narrative coming through and it really appealed to people. We offered the exhibition in, as a digital exhibition, I think this time last year uh, at the University of Sydney. And I think that if we, maybe we should do some more, another print run of the, um, of the, we've got the cards, but to do another print run of the large format photographs, because I think we could. We, we could definitely promote those through the Australian Plant Society. I think a lot of our members would be very interested and fascinated to buy either a card or a larger print. So definitely keep that in mind. And I noticed that. That would be amazing. Yeah, Dan Clark's just sent a, a comment too. Um, he attended your lectures in 2007 and he remembers the orchid root sections in particular looking magical. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I know it was really fun. I think we, yeah, they are, they are amazing. And to get students to do this and to look down the microscope, you kind of, I wait for it because they're like, God, it's really hard to section a plant. And then when they do it and they look down the microscope and their microscope set up properly, you just wait for it. You hear it, wow, 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 you know, all through the class. And it, it just makes, you just like, I've got you now. <laughs> I've got you. Now, now I've got mm. a question about the um, Aboriginal names, um, Roseanne. I seem to remember reading something that Aboriginal people didn't necessarily have one name for a species like we do and they might have actually named had several names for a plant based on its function at different times of the year or what it was doing at different times of the year have you sort of heard anything like that or i know that there are other cultures that do that so the the chinese name for ginkgo is is that there isn't one name it's based off which part of the plant because they've got different they're used for in different medicines um, I don't know enough about Aboriginal namings of anything, really. Um, mm. So I just keep, I always look over at uh, Jackie Troy and use the work. So we only have, particularly for the Sydney region, we only have Western documentation to help us. Um, 
and probably maybe some uh, language that still that had that that was that that was passed down. Uh, language is is what what colonization did to Aboriginal languages is appalling, and and I think to be able to at least bring it back um, and reconnect it in in some way to legitimately to the objects that we know in the plants um, it's trying to reconstruct the fragments of what we have um, even the word gymere or gumia is the name of the gymere lily so even walking so now when i'm in because i'm literally in gymere right now i just think ah so gymere it's spelled like that but because spelling is a Western construct, I find that even more fascinating than many names for a plant. Um, it's how Westerners wrote down the names that they were hearing from Aboriginal people um, and the spelling. So if you look at Jackie Troy's work, she'll have all different spellings and then she'll have in brackets who recorded that particular version of the word. Mm. But yeah, if you move up the coast, you wouldn't call it uh, gymea. It's like the word koala. Koala is not what you would call a koala in Sydney. You would call it gulamani, which is the Sydney language word for koala. So I think it's recognising the, um, the, the different languages and how they've kind of been massively disrupted with colonisation. Oh, there's definitely so much um, still to learn. And I will just mention one issue that often comes up with us. We often get a lot of requests from people who want to know where they can go to do a course about native plant identification. And we always struggle to recommend suitable courses to people. So I'm saying there's definitely a gap in the market there um, for people who aren't necessarily enrolled as a uni student with you but do want sort of a rigorous course of um, native plant identification. Um, so keep that in mind amongst your other projects as well. Um, Jenny, I noticed you've got a, a question waving your hand there. Do you want to unmute yourself? Uh, yeah, I just um, wanted to ask Roseanne. Um, I actually work in the microscopy unit at Sydney Uni. Um, and uh, I was wondering if you'd ever used uh, our SEMs to do any image or imaging of your um, plants. I haven't done SEM, but I do have a, another project that I'm going to do with the medical imaging people, which is to get some CT scans. So if you've got a bit of time on your hands um, and Google CT scans of flowers, and again, your your mind will be blown. Well, so we have a the, as well. <laughs> so, uh, so Jenny, I might be knocking on your door because if you can imagine a grevillea flower, um, or even a you know a grass tree flower, and CT micro CT scanning that. Mm -hmm. And then yep. we now have the pedestal system where we can mount those 3D objects mm. for uh, to be able to interrogate them. So yeah. it's this kind email, of work that I think, email. but it's fun. <laughs> yeah, well, sure. Put my questions. email in the chat for you, Roseanne. Yeah. And Thank I'm you so much. That would be so fun. Fairly standard email addresses. Does anyone have any final questions for Roseanne, either that you want to type in the chat box or wave your hand around and I'll see if I can uh, spot you or unmute yourself? Okay, well, there was so much to absorb there, Roseanne. I think we're still um, trying to come to terms with the art, the music, the culture, the technology and the history. So there was a lot there, so much for sharing uh, thanks so much for sharing that with us and I think you've left us with a lot to think about and some websites to follow up so we'll try and make sure we can put some of those links in our next newsletter. So if everyone would like to join with me in uh, thanking Roseanne, a round of a <laughs> solid applause. Uh, so thank you very much Roseanne. Um, yeah, now if you'd like to you. stay for our next lot. You're most welcome to, but if you do have other things to do, like planning for your next class, uh, we certainly understand that as well. 
Uh, I've got a gin and tonic actually that I need to get back to. Yeah, you can <laughs> well deserve. So thanks very much. And I'll um, move on to our next segment, which you um, might be interested in as well. Thank you. Uh, so the next segment of our meeting tonight is where members have sent in photos of what's in flower in their garden to Dan Clark, who's acting as our plant steward, our online plant steward. Uh, so Dan has collected all these photos into a PowerPoint presentation and he's going to share his screen in a minute and just talk about those photos that people have uh, sent in. And we did have a bit of a discussion before we started and I said it would be good just to get a bit of an idea of how many photos there are so we can see how we're going through the photos. So just to let you know, there are about 35 photos. Uh, so if you do need to just have a you know, turn your video off and go and get a cup of tea or something and come back quickly, there'll still be uh, photos when you get back. So I might now hand over to Dan and ask Dan to share his screen and just talk about some of the plants. And if you want to type a question in the chat box, that's fine.